So to, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Renato Bediol from CUNY, who will speak on minimal spheres and ellipsoids. So thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, give a talk in the seminar. Um, <clears throat> so all that uh, I'll, I'll present today is actually joint work with Paolo Piccione. Um, and I figured that before we, we really uh, you know, launch like a rocket and start going too fast with things. I'll just remind everyone of things that probably everybody in the audience knows, but just to be safe and have everyone on the same page, uh, let's just remember a few basic definitions. So I apologize, I'll be writing uh, on the tablet, so I'll be looking down a lot. But um, so <clears throat> everything's going to happen in a Riemannian manifold, uh, and we're going to be looking at hypersurfaces, so only co dimension one submanifolds um, today. And remember that if you have such a submanifold, right, we can take small variations of it. Uh, so you can perturb it a little bit. That's this phi t of sigma. And you can see how the area changes. And it's a classical uh, exercise in, in Riemannian geometry that the first variation of area is an integral over the surface of the product of the mean curvature vector and the variational field. So V here is the vector field that somehow prescribes the direction in which you're changing. So in particular, uh, it follows that if you have a critical point of this area functional, right, a stationary point, um, <clears throat> that's the same thing as saying that the mean curvature vanishes. And these are the so-called minimal surfaces, right? So sigma is minimal if it is a stationary point for area. So say critical for area, which is the same thing as saying that um, the, mean curvature van the, the mean curvature vector vanishes identically, okay? Uh, they need not be area minimizers, right? Remember that um, <clears throat> it could be a, a saddle point, for example. And in dimension two, um, one-dimensional minimal uh, things in your two-dimensional uh, surface are just geodesics, right? So this generalizes the concept uh, of um, geodesics. And uh, in dimension three, which is where we're going to focus today, if the surface that is minimal in a three-manifold happens to be diffeomorphic to a sphere, uh, we'll call it a minimal two sphere. So minimal two spheres are the main character for, uh, for the talk. And, um, and another important fact is that if the ambient space has positive Ricci curvature, then any two minimal hypersurfaces uh, intersect. That's by Frankel's theorem. So uh, if I have two minimal uh, uh, surfaces inside a three-dimensional manifold, then the intersection uh, is not empty. And actually, it's also transverse because, because the maximum principle. So they can't intersect uh, just tangentially. And everything in this talk will be uh, smooth and embedded. Okay. So when I, uh, when I was trying to think about how to prepare a talk about minimal two spheres and motivate it, I did probably what most people would do. And I just put it on Google. So I Googled minimal sphere. Uh, and I realized that all of these things are actually not minimal spheres. Okay. You can't see a minimal sphere in R3, right? This thing, you know, it looks nice and round, but it's not minimal in R3. There's no compact embedded minimal surfaces in R3. Okay, they're all, uh, I mean, it's properly embedded. I mean, you can have immersed tori, for example, in R3, which are minimal, um, but these are rather complicated objects. And, and so when you think about a minimal two sphere, think about an ambient space, which is gonna have some curvature and it's gonna be compact for us in this talk, okay? Um, <clears throat> all right, so let's, let's talk about some minimal two spheres that actually are minimal two spheres in, in some three-dimensional manifold. Uh, the three-dimensional manifold that I want to consider is this ellipsoid. So it's represented here by this kind of two-dimensional picture, but of course I'm lowering dimension by one, right? It's a three-dimensional object given by this equation here, which, you know, it's the, exactly the, the ellipsoid equation that we teach in vector calculus, except that it has one more entry there. And I can assume I can order the semi-axis here, A, B, C, and D, uh, and assume, for example, that, that they are decreasing in order. And so this embedding of the three sphere in R4 uh, induces a metric on the three sphere, which I'll call G, okay? So for each choice of A, B, C, and D, I have a metric. It's actually a positively curved metric on the three sphere. Um, and it has this nice property that because of the way it's embedded, if I intersect with a plane, for example, if I take this coordinate hyperplane here, then the intersection is this, uh, this circle that I drew here. The circle really represents a, a, a two sphere, right? This plane is a three-dimensional plane. Uh, that circle is a two-dimensional circle. It's really a two sphere. 
And, uh, and of course, if I reflect across this hyperplane, that's an isometry of the ambient space. It restricts to an isometry of the three sphere and it fixes that circle. So that, uh, and I should stop calling it a circle, it's really a two sphere, it fixes this two sphere. And as such, that's a totally geodesic submanifold, right? Uh, in particular, it's minimal, right? So, um, so I can do that with any of these coordinate hyperplanes. And there's four of them, right? This would be x1 equal to zero. Then I have x2 equal to zero, x3 equal to zero. I can you know, reflect across any of these four guys. And I get four totally geodesic, uh, let's call them planar minimal two spheres, okay? Actually totally geodesic, as I said. So these are the planar minimal two spheres. And in this kind of provoking question, Yao in 87 asked, are these all of them? Could it be that there's no other minimal two sphere in these metrics aside from, from these four, okay? Um, so I don't really know what the motivation uh, of Yao was to, to provoke in the sense of trying to find more or really uh, perhaps it's optimist in a sense because, because by, by topological reasons, okay? Uh, if one thinks about min-max theory, by topological reasons, the space of two spheres inside three spheres has such a topology that it guarantees at least existence of these four. So four is the minimum you can possibly get. Uh, and the question is, can you get any more? Okay, um, by the way, I, uh, I guess it goes without saying, but if there's any questions along the way, please feel free to interrupt me, uh, okay? So, um, so a few results in this direction, uh, actually a result that predates the question, Almgren in 66, uh, has shown that indeed, uh, the answer is yes, if the metric is round, okay? So if I take A, B, C, and D all equal to one another, the only minimal two spheres inside the round three sphere are totally geodesic. They're actually uh, intersections with uh, linear subspaces, linear hyperplanes. And of course, there's infinitely many of them, right? But they're all conjugates. They're all the same geometrically. Okay, um, Brian White uh, in, in 2017 uh, then was able to show that this is true for nearly round ellipsoids. So if I take a, B, C, and D sufficiently close. Uh, so something that is a small deformation of, of a round sphere, then the answer is still affirmative, okay? There's only D. Um, but then uh, in a paper that appeared in 2019, but uh, I, guess, uh, I guess it was on the archive probably a couple of years before, uh, Hasselhofer, Bob Hasselhofer and Dan Ketover were able to show that indeed, uh, if you elongate the ellipsoid a lot and you have something that looks kind of like what I try to show in this picture, the answer turns to no. Okay, so if A is large enough uh, for fixed uh, B, C, and D, for fixed B, C, and D, which are the smaller semi-axis, uh, then there exists at least one other minimal two sphere, which is not planar. Okay, so that's what I represent here with this yellow kind of curve that wraps around twice. And, you know, uh, at least if you live in the, in the US, you probably see disclaimers like these in essentially everything you buy. Uh, the image here is kind of a lie, okay? It, it doesn't really look like that because of course, I mean, aside from the fact that it's one dimensional lower, right? Uh, what I drew here has, for example, self-intersections, okay? The, in the two sphere that they find, the, the minimal two sphere that they find is actually embedded, okay? It does not have self-intersections, right? It is, however, close to this, this uh, central one. So remember the central one, I guess I'm calling pi one, is the intersection with uh, x1 equal to zero. Uh, so it is close to it and it's close to twice that in some sense that, that I'll make precise in a moment. Uh, but of course it does not self-intersect. All right, um, so let's, let's say a little bit more about their construction, how they found this, um, this minimal two sphere, which is not planar, okay? So, uh, here's a few more details on, on their work. Um, so first of all, they showed that there's at least one guy, right? So I'll say here at least uh, one non-planar uh, embedded minimal two sphere, which I'll call sigma uh, HK for Hasselhofer et Um And the techniques that they use uh, are actually very interesting. It's a combination of two very powerful methods, namely min-max theory, uh, min-max theory for minimal hypersurfaces, and they also use mean curvature flow. So, um, so it's a combination of these two things. Uh, I'm not gonna say much more about how, how that goes. So I'll just say that 
um, it, it, it's found using the second width. So there's this notion of K width on a manifold. Uh, and if you've been to one of these uh, many min-max uh, talks lately, you probably have, have heard about it. So I'm not gonna dwell too much on it. It, it somehow has to do with sweep out of the manifold that use two parameters to sweep out. And then you kind of pull tight these sweep outs and you find a minimal guy as a result. And that's the minimal guy that they found. And somehow they can show it's a sphere, okay? So there's control on the topology here because they're using a version of minmax that allows for that. Uh, so, so it has to do with this, uh, this notion of second width. And, and perhaps more importantly, geometrically, the consequence of that is that the area of this sigma HK uh, there's a good control on it. It's actually between the area of the central one. So remember central one, I'll call pi one here, this, this vertical looking thing. So it's bigger than that, okay? And it's less than twice of it. Okay, so we know exactly um, the interval where the area of this, uh, this yellow fellow here lies, okay? Um, and moreover, they are also able to show that if you keep elongating, so sending A to infinity somehow corresponds to, you know, uh, pushing this further and further out. Okay, if you keep elongating the ellipsoid, uh, then this, uh, this yellow guy that they found actually gets closer and closer to, to the central one and, and double covers it in some sense. Okay, it kind of converges to twice of it. So it converges to pi one with multiplicity two uh, in, in very fold sense. Okay. So, um, so these are some of the qualitative properties, I guess, of, of their solution. Um, and then let me then come to the main result, uh, of, of today's talk, which again is joint work with, uh, with Paolo Piccione. So we're able to show that if you assume a little bit more, at least for now, if you, if you assume that, uh, two of the semi axes agree. So if either B is equal to C or C is equal to D, then the number of um, uh, distinct nonplanar embedded minimal two spheres uh, actually goes to infinity, okay? Goes to infinity as A goes to infinity. So if you want to find a million of them, you, you just need to elongate uh, your ellipsoid enough, right? Uh, if it's oblate enough, it has arbitrarily many uh, nonplanar embedded minimal. Yes? Okay, so- um, uh, Renato, can I ask a question? Of course. This is Ravi. Um, can you go back to the previous slide with the- yes. So you said as A goes to infinity, you get this sort of uh, kind of this double cover in the variable sense. Um, what happens if you reduce A? Kind of what, at what point does the effect disappear? That's a very nice question. Uh, Thank you, I worked I, on I uh, <laughs> I thought about that uh, myself actually for geodesics too. I was wondering like you can do this one dimension lower, right? And that gives us some intuition. So if your ellipsoid is an ellipsoid of revolution, uh, a two dimensional ellipsoid of revolution, then the new guy appears only when one of the semi axes is twice the other. That's the critical thing. I don't know if that's the same for the three dimensional case, uh, and. I'm not sure that their methods actually tell you that. Uh, their methods are, I think they will guarantee the existence of such a thing for A large enough, but it doesn't qualify what's the first A where that happens. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, potentially we could answer that at least for, for the, the minimal surfaces that, that we find with this technique. Um, but anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that later perhaps. So uh, also in this picture, again, the same disclaimer applies here in this picture, right? It's, it's uh, somewhat uh, misleading, uh, but there's a few characteristics of it that are uh, honest uh, properties of the minimal surface that we find. And, and I'll get to these uh, in detail uh, as I show you the construction, but just to point them out uh, rather quickly here, uh, we have this kind of horizontal guy, right? This, this very long planar minimal two sphere. Uh, this one, it will intersect the yellow surfaces, the ones that, uh, that are not planar. Uh, of course, any two minimal spheres intersect here, but it will intersect them more and more often, okay? 
we're able to show that these guys are geometrically distinct, that the number of them goes to plus infinity, because we can actually distinguish them by how many times they intersect this horizontal one. They intersect them more and more uh, as, as the ellipsoid elongates. And also, if you notice, they're kind of invariant under reflection across this middle guy, right? So uh, I come here and then it kind of reflects on that side, right? It comes here and then reflects on that side. So that's, that's actually a, a true property. These things are invariant under this involution which reflects across pi one, okay? All right, so, um, so let me show you how uh, more or less we, we set up the problem, okay? So of course this hypothesis here, uh, and being a seminar about uh, symmetries, of course, this, this has to do with, with symmetries, right? This hypothesis here uh, allows you to use a circle action. Uh, so let's, let's see what symmetries we have going on for us. So we have a few, uh, a few discrete symmetries as well, which, which as I alluded to already, will, will play an important role. So first of all, of course, if all the semi-axes are distinct, if A, B, C, and D are, are uh, you know, different from each other, then I only get discrete symmetries. I only get these reflections. And I'll paint the first one in blue, uh, this, this middle, this X1 one, since I refer to it later like that. But then I have also another three copies of Z2, which is just the reflections across, uh, the reflections that fix the, the planar minimal uh, two spheres. If, however, two of these semi-axes agree, then we can stick in an O2 in there, right? So we have a uh, O2 action, which rotates the plane corresponding to either X2 and X3 or X3 and X4, uh, depending on which of these two hypotheses I have. Um, and of course, I, I still have the blue Z2 because the blue Z2 is, is never gonna be included in the circle action, it's, it's away, okay? Um, and uh, I have another extra Z2, which is somehow reflection across uh, the horizontal fellow here that, that I'll show you in a moment. So the non-planar minimal two spheres in the theorem above, okay, these ones that we find, they are invariant under, under, um, under this action, okay? So under O2 cross Z2, the blue Z2, and they intersect each other um, they intersect the other uh, invariant planar minimal two sphere pi. This red pi is this pi here that in the picture is in red, okay? So this guy here, this guy here is the only other um, O2 cross Z2 invariant um, minimal two sphere, uh, which is planar. The other planar ones don't have the symmetry, okay? Um, for example, this blue one, okay, uh, it, um, uh, it has the symmetry as well, right? Sorry, I should have said, pi is the only one other than the blue one that does not have the symmetry. So if I look at, so let me rephrase that better. So if you look at planar minimal two spheres, which are invariant under O2 cross Z2, there's only two of them. It's either this red one that I'm calling pi or the blue one, which is invariant under uh, this, this Z2. Okay, and, um, and as I said, the, the minimal surfaces that we find, they intersect pi um, at a different number of orbits, okay? So each of these intersection points corresponds to a circle. Well, actually, two circles, I think. All right, so, um, so let me show you more or less the, the strategy for proof, okay? So this is perhaps a little daunting slide with a lot of words in it and a lot of things going on, but this is just to give you a rough idea of, of what the path is. And for the remainder of the talk, I'll just slowly go through each one of these four main steps, okay? So that's more or less also the plan for, for the talk. So the first thing that we do is to exploit the symmetries and somehow reduce the problem to the problem of finding free boundary geodesics in a certain other object, a two-dimensional object. Um, then we need to study these geodesics. So it's, it's a slightly complicated object, it's not just a manifold with boundary or anything. It has some singularities. So it, it takes some, some effort to study these geodesics. And we're gonna use the plateau problem. So the, the boxes that are painted in red here are, are the, the slightly more challenging parts, okay? That's where the, the, the hard uh, stuff lies. Uh, so we're gonna use the plateau problem solution actually to find these geodesics. And we're gonna discuss the variational characterization that, that we use then in the next few steps. Uh, and then we apply bifurcation theory. So we're gonna use a local uh, bifurcation result 
which is um, powered by an analysis of a singular storm UV equation, and then a global bifurcation result to actually distinct to, 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 to distinguish between these uh, branches of, of minimal surfaces that we find. So that's more or less how you uh, go along to find these arbitrarily many minimal spheres. So let's let's begin with the first uh, with the first part, this this symmetry reduction. Okay. And this is work of, um, of Xiang and Lawson uh, in the 70s. It's classical work, and it has been used to find minimal surfaces in, in a variety of contexts already. So uh, here's more or less how it works. Suppose you have a group action, Lie group G acting on a manifold M isometrically. And uh, let's denote by pi the quotient map. Okay, so here I have um, <clears throat> the quotient map represented there is the orbit space. Uh, and let's denote by M sub PR here for uh, principle, the principal part. So this is the principal part of the manifold. These are the points of the manifold where the isotropy is the smallest possible. And uh, it's a classical result in, in transformation groups that this is an open subset, uh, it's dense and it's connected, okay? So, um, so it's, it's a big chunk of the manifold, right? It's essentially everything. Um, and if you restrict the projection map to uh, the principal part, you actually get a nice smooth Riemannian submersion. So this uh, this portion here that we're uh, that we're finding in the quotient, it uh, it is it has a manifold structure. The whole quotient might have some singularities, but just the principal part is a manifold, and and that uh, gives you a Riemannian submersion there. Um, and we can define the volume function in the quotient uh, in the following way. We just take a point x in the quotient. So here's you know, my x in the quotient. There is a certain orbit over here. Maybe I'll draw it just as a line, uh, which is gx up there in the manifold. I compute the volume of gx with respect to the original metric. Um, and that's the value of the function at that point, OK? So this actually defines a smooth function. Um, and it extends to the boundary, but it extends to a continuous function on the boundary. So continuous function on, uh, I, I'm saying boundary here, but you know, the other strata. So everything else aside from the principal part. So it extends to a continuous function on the whole orbit space. Um, and if you have boundary, this part that I'm painting in red here, uh, it corresponds to orbits of lower dimension. So the, the volume will go to zero there, okay? And if we're trying to find minimal um, submanifolds, I can imagine drawing perhaps here, uh, let's see, uh, let me use a different color here. So I can imagine trying to find like a, an orange minimal uh, hypersurface sigma there, which is made of orbits, right? So this surface is foliated by orbits of the group action. And if I'm trying to find such a thing, I can look for curves uh, here, uh, curves because I'm, I'm drawing this as a two-dimensional thing, right? But, you know, submanifolds of the, the principal part uh, that satisfy a certain property uh, because minimality for sigma up there should have something to do with uh, some kind of minimality for the quotient here of the principal part of sigma. And indeed, what Xiang and Lawson have, uh, have shown is that uh, it corresponds to minimality with respect to a conformal metric. So instead of looking at the usual quotient metric there, I need to rescale it with the volume function. So I look at this particular power here of the volume function, which is called the cohomogeneity of the hypersurface. Um, it's not a homogeneity of the action, it's the homogeneity of the hypersurface. Um, and I rescale my, my metric by it, um, and I request that this be minimal. So if this is a minimal submanifold of the quotient, then the pre-image uh, up there is a minimal submanifold of the original space, okay? Uh, and that's an if and only if. But notice, of course, that this poses some, some trouble because, uh, of course, V is zero on the boundary. So this object, even if it was a manifold with boundary, now it has a singular boundary, right? So it's going to have some, some uh, it's going to be a little finicky to, to study geodesics there. All right, so let's apply this to our setting, okay? How does this translate to the situation that I was telling you before? Well, it translates in the following way. 
without loss of generality, let me assume that B is equal to C, okay? The case C is equal to D is completely analogous. And so let's just choose one for, for now and forever. Uh, so these two are the same and O2 is the group acting for me. So it's rotating uh, these two coordinates. Great. Well, then it's pretty clear that the orbits are gonna look like that, right? So I just rotate these two middle coordinates and it has a bunch of fixed points. The fixed points are exactly uh, the places where X2 and X3 are equal to zero because if, if these two are gone, then, then of course G is not doing anything. Uh, and the principal part is everything minus the fixed points, okay? It's S3 minus the fixed point set. Um, and then it's not so hard to convince yourself that the quotient space uh, by this O2 action looks kind of like this picture. It's a half ellipsoid. And this is an honest picture now. It's a two-dimensional ellipsoid uh, with this kind of ellipsoidal metric. So exactly the one induced by this, um, by this embedding into R3. So essentially I'm replacing X2 and X3 by R, okay, by the radius of, of the circle that is there. And the boundary here, this red uh, boundary, is where the radius is equal to zero, okay? That's exactly the fixed point set. So the fixed point set in this uh, representation corresponds to R equal to zero. Um, so of course, if you have a radius zero, your circle is not, is not rotating, right? It's just a point, right? So it's fixed. And, and by the same token, you can think of R as the height function here. R equal to zero is the boundary. And then for each level set of R, uh, these are orbits that have the same volume, okay? So the volume function is a multiple of, of R, right? It's, it's the length of that circle, it's two pi R, okay? Um, and you can write it in terms of X1 and X4 if you solve for R in, in, in the equation there. Uh, and so the object that we want to study uh, minimal, uh, minimal surfaces, but they're really gonna be minimal curves, so geodesics in, is, is this object. Uh, with the renormalization given by, by this volume function. So we want, um, we want to find minimal things in here, but if I take, for example, a curve which stays inside, okay, and even if it was minimal, uh, when I lift, I'm gonna have a bunch of circles, right? Each of these points is a circle. So I'm gonna get some kind of torus looking thing or a Klein bottle, but a torus really. Uh, and, and I want spheres, right? We want minimal two spheres. So I have to insist that the curve that we study goes to the boundary. So I have to start at the boundary and end at the boundary. Because now I have circles all the way uh, here in the middle and the endpoints are fixed points. So I have point, circles, point, right? So that's a two sphere. So, uh, so I want to insist that the image here is a free boundary geodesic. Free boundary because that corresponds to uh, smoothness of, uh, of this at, at this point. So it has to arrive here uh, in, in the right way with the right angle so that when I lift, I get something that is actually smooth at that point. Okay, so I want to study free boundary geodesics on this omega A, and that will give me minimal two spheres uh, in the original space, okay? Uh, so let's talk about these geodesics then. So that's the second uh, step, if you remember in the roadmap there to, to the proof. So um, here's a, you know, projected image of, of, of this guy, right? So I'm just smashing it so it's easier to draw there. Uh, and let's parameterize the boundary. Okay, so let's say alpha is a parameterization, parameterization of the boundary. So this is A times cosine S comma D times sine S. So alpha of zero is right here and alpha pi over two is right there. Uh, these are going to be important points for us. And let's say Vs is the normal, the unit normal. Okay, so this guy is the unit normal pointing inside, just like in the picture, okay, to alpha s. Um, then what one can show is that uh, all of these uh, points and vectors are initial conditions for geodesics. Uh, and there's actually a unique geodesic starting at each of these alpha s's that shoots inside, okay? There's a unique uh, maximal geodesic gamma s with uh, gamma zero, uh, as in the limit as t goes to zero of gamma t being alpha of s. So that's the s that I'm using there to denote where it came from, okay? And uh, initial vector is exactly equal to vs, okay? Uh, 
this would be rather uh, obvious if this manifold was was an honest you know manifold with boundary. But remember that our metric on omega a is singular along this boundary. Okay, there's no obvious way of defining a normal exponential map for this boundary. Um, at least I, I don't know of any normal uh, exponential map unless you assume something very special about the volume function that vanishes there. For example, if it was some kind of function of the distance to the boundary or things like that, you could maybe get around. But our situation actually does not allow for that. Okay, so. Um, Renato? Yes. Can I ask a question? So, how sure. singular is that metric on the boundary? What can you say about the as you approach the boundary for the metric? So, let me see how I can answer that. Um, so the conformal factor goes to zero, just like the height function goes to zero here. Actually, the square of it, right? So the conformal factor is v squared, which is proportional to r squared, OK? So if you think about this height function along, uh, along the ellipsoid, um, the, the singularity is just like r squared for the conformal factor. So that's actually a very controlled kind of singularity, right? Yes, yes. So it's a very controlled kind of thing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, can you just say something then about the exponential map? That's the thing. Uh, I probably, but I the only but, but it's kind of circular. The only way I know how to say something about the exponential map is by doing the the study of geodesics in the way that I that I did. So, um, for example. If it was a, a function of the distance to the boundary, that would be a lot easier. So think about the distance function here to the boundary. Of course, it's, it's a little bit higher here and lower there, right? So the level set of the distance function looks more or less like this, okay? And, and the volume is not, right? The volume is actually just the flat intersection. If these two things were the same, then yeah, then, then I think it would be easier to say something about the normal exponential map. But as far as I'm, as far as I know, I, there's not really an obvious way of dealing with that. Okay. Well, let me show you a workaround, perhaps, if uh, if you want to think of it that way. So here's a proof of this theorem. Okay, the the fact that from each point I can shoot out a geodesic. So here's where we're going to use the plateau problem. Um, take x here sufficiently close to the boundary. Okay. And uh, let's look at the pre-image. So let's say this here is pi inverse of x. So that is a uh, circle, right? It's an orbit of O2. Uh, and the other component of, of O2 acts in the same way. So it's just one circle. Uh, and everything in my manifold is nice and analytic. So this is actually a real analytic circle. Uh, and it is extremal in the following sense. Uh, because I'm very close, uh, this circle is very small in a way that it fits inside the surface of a geodesic ball, which is smaller, that has radius smaller than the convexity radius. So it fits in the boundary of a convex set, okay, a mean convex set. Uh, and this is, this is important because it will tell us that if you try to solve the plateau problem here, if you try to fill in the circle with a minimal disk, you can do that. And uh, you can do that with a least area disk, uh, which I'm calling here dx, uh, with that boundary. And this uh, minimal disk, it is unique by extremality. It is smooth. Uh, up to the boundary, and that's by real analyticity. Uh, and it is embedded. That's not too hard to see. And it's G invariant. Uh, G invariance is obvious from uniqueness, right? Because if I just rotate a little bit, I get another one. So of course, this thing has to be made of orbits, okay? And by uh, rather uh, obvious topological reasons, this thing is made of orbits. The orbits are circles or points. So I can't just foliate the disk with circles, right? I, I need a point there in the middle, okay? So it will intersect a fixed point somewhere. That means that when I project, I will get a little curve, maybe a painted in blue like that. I'll get a little curve here um, that goes to the boundary, okay? And uh, I can parametrize this curve in such a way that zero is on the boundary. 
Um, and so that's what I have written here. I can parameterize in such a way that when I go to zero, I reach some point, let's say alpha of s, I parameterize the boundary with alpha of s. Um, and I guess I'm calling the point P, so let me complete the picture here so that it kind of matches my notation there. And by the symmetry reduction argument that we saw before, this is a, an actual geodesic, right? I mean, because it was minimal up there, so it has to be a minimal down here with the conformal metric. Um, now, why is the tangent vector the right one? Well, that's by smoothness of the disk above. Since this disk is smooth, when I project here, I have to arrive with a, with a 90 degree angle, okay? Um, and moreover, it is unique by the maximum principle. Because if I had another one, if I zoom in there and I put in another one, let's say, you know, I have a green curve arriving there, then I can lift this green curve and I'll get a minimal green disc, okay? Uh, which is tangent at that point and uh, minimal, right? And, and that can't be, right? That would violate the maximum principle. So there can only be one geodesic arriving at each boundary point. Um, okay, great. So this proves this existence uh, and uniqueness. And there's also, uh, you know, a, a good dependence on the boundary point. So gamma S, which is this geodesic that, that leaves alpha S, it depends smoothly on S, actually depends real and real analytically on S, okay? Um, okay, great. So now, now we can um, set up the strategy to, to find our minimal two spheres in the following way. We know that each point here gives me a geodesic. It's kind of clear that if I start from that point, the geodesic will be this horizontal fellow. And if I start from that point, it will be this vertical guy. So I'm calling them gamma horizontal and gamma vertical. Okay, so these are geodesics and they are exactly the images of the blue and red planar minimal two spheres, the, the total geodesic ones that we saw in the beginning. Uh, and they're invariant under this Z2, Z2 action, right? You have the blue Z2, which does this, and you have the other Z2, which reflects that way. Uh, so there are fixed point sets of, of, these, um, of these involutions, and the pre-images the pre are these planar uh, minimal two spheres that we saw before. Um, okay, so what's the strategy? The strategy is to find some gamma s that perhaps start from here and hits the vertical fellow exactly with a 90 degree angle. So I want it to meet this guy orthogonally because then I know it started orthogonally, right? If it meets here orthogonally, when I reflect, I'll, wait, I'll be able to find something that, well, maybe it goes a little bit higher up. I'll be able to find something that here arrives orthogonally as well. And that will be a, um, a free boundary geodesic then, right? So I want to reflect across. I want to reflect across uh, the vertical uh, geodesic. And then I'll find a minimal uh, sphere by just lifting this back to S3. Okay, and this, is, uh, this strategy is, is, is not new. This is inspired by the work of Xiang on the spherical Bernstein problem. So, um, there's, there's an important generalization of, of the Bernstein problem that was proposed by Chern, uh, which is to look at the round sphere, okay, in, in higher dimensions. So in dimension three, we know that the only minimal two spheres in a round three sphere are totally geodesic by that theorem of Almgren. But look at a four dimensional round sphere or higher and ask yourself the same question. Take a hypersurface there, minimal hypersurface, which is a sphere, so a subsphere of co-dimension one and minimal. Does it have to be totally geodesic like Almgren's theorem in dimension three? And the answer is no, okay? Actually in dimension four already. And the counterexamples built by Xiang were found more or less using this kind of strategy. He looks at, at, at group actions, look at a quotient and find three boundary geodesics that kind of do this. However, it is qualitatively similar, but technically rather different. So the only metric that he considered is the round metric, right? The question was about the round sphere. And we are using these changing metrics, right? We're, we're gonna expand this, this, this guy. So he actually has a few extra killing fields in the quotient. Because the metric was round above, when you project, you have a killing field, and that allows you to actually write down an ODE for these geodesics and integrate out one of the, one of the functions. We cannot do that, okay? There's no other killing field here. That's it, okay? There's, there's only these E2s. So technically, the study of, of the ODE is somewhat more, more complicated, uh, at least, uh, it seems to be in, in, in this case without, without killing fields. Um, but nevertheless, 
uh, there's there's a way to do it, and it it uses some of these uh, facts that I'll, I'll quickly mention here, so I can uh, tell you about the bifurcation part. So some topological arguments uh, will tell you that these geodesics that you know start from there. Uh, so maybe I'll draw a few of them, right? So I have one here, one there. You know these geodesics. Um, they never self-intersect. Okay, they they they're not going to do something like this. Okay, this here does not happen, okay, this is forbidden. So they do not self-intersect. And this will then translate into the minimal surface that we find actually being embedded, right? Uh, and they also uh, intersect the uh, vertical geodesic. They always do that transversely, okay? Transversely. So whenever they meet here, they're never gonna be tangent to it. And that's kind of clear again, because otherwise you know, you have uniqueness here, right? So if they always intersect the, the, the middle guy, the vertical guy, and they do so transversely, uh, there's a first intersection point, and let's call that gamma s tau s, okay? Let's call this the first intersection point. And um, the dependence on uh, s uh, is, is nice, okay? This guy, is uh, both of these guys are smooth. The dependence on the arrival time function and the, um, and the geodesic, okay? Both depend smoothly on, on that. And so I can define a function f right here, which has to do with the angle of arrival. So I look at this tangent vector. So maybe, maybe I'll draw a little bit lower here. So this is my gamma prime s tau s, okay? It's the tangent vector when it arrives. And I measure its angle with the, with the vertical vector. So maybe I'll paint in green here, E2, okay? Which is this tangent uh, vector to the, to the vertical geodesic. And then of course I want zeros of this function. So I want to find uh, S, I want to find values of S such as perhaps that one, such that the arrival here is orthogonal, okay? So I encoded this into this function. So zeros of this function correspond to embedded minimal two spheres upstairs. Um, also notice that zero, so S equal to zero, alpha of zero, which is there, is always a solution. And that's because this red geodesic is always there. No matter how long A is, this guy is always gonna be there. So F A zero is always zero, no matter what A is. So the strategy is then to find bifurcations. So I want to look for bifurcations um, from zero, and qualitatively something like in this picture. So here I'm representing A along the horizontal axis, and here is the parameter S, okay, where S can live. Uh, zero is always gonna be a solution. So what I'm painting here in red is this geodesic for each value of A. And then I want to find instance where something happens and the geodesic, and there's a bifurcation of solutions. So new solutions are born and solutions that then persist all the way to infinity. So if I am able to do this, then if I go further down the road enough, I can find arbitrarily many of these guys. And all of these will be distinct uh, minimal hypersurfaces by, um, by the intersection argument because they're gonna intersect the horizontal guy in different places. Uh, these guys here in the bottom, they're actually the same because they, they are related by this reflection, okay? So uh, if you want to count how many, you count just on one side, okay? All right, so hopefully this, uh, this explains the, the, the setup uh, in, in great detail and we're half the way there, uh, but I allotted just uh, less than half the time of the talk to the proof. So uh, in the last uh, 13, 14 minutes or so, I'll tell you about the last two steps, okay? Which are the local bifurcation and the global bifurcation part. So how do we establish the existence of these branches? All right, great. So let's, let's go on to the local bifurcation result. So this is a, it's a classical theorem of Crandall and Rabinovitz from, from the 70s, okay? And it says the following. So it's completely abstract here. Suppose I have a function, I'll apply it to that function f of a and s, but you know, just f uh, right here. And suppose that there's some a star like that, where the derivative of the function with respect to s is zero. Um, and the mixed derivative, okay, the second derivative is not zero. Then what happens is that there exists a neighborhood, so maybe I'll paint here uh, this neighborhood, maybe U, 
uh, there's a neighborhood of that point, uh, a star comma zero, which lies in the trivial branch, such that the set of solutions, so the set of solutions is F inverse of zero, intersected with this neighborhood, gives me the trivial branch, so the stuff that I knew was there, so that's a comma zero uh, for all a's such that this guy is in U. And there exists some other curve here, maybe I'll call this B, okay, where B is a bifurcating branch, okay? It is actually a smooth uh, curve uh, that I'll call a bifurcating branch. So uh, this curve actually intersects uh, there transversely. And if you think about it, this condition here is exactly saying that you cannot apply the implicit function theorem, right? If you're hoping to show that zero is locally unique, one way to do it would be, well, the way to do it really would be the implicit function theorem. This is saying the implicit function theorem does not apply, right? I mean, the, it's a degenerate critical point. And this is saying, uh, actually, this is the topological condition that tells you that in addition to degeneracy, uh, this gives you existence of locally other points, uh, which are solutions and other points that actually fit in a nice smooth curve like this. So we're gonna use this theorem uh, and to use this theorem, I need to verify its hypothesis. So I need to show you what the derivatives look like. So that's the next thing I want to do. Um, let's simplify our lives a bit and assume that the time of arrival is constant equal to one. I can achieve this by a simple reparameterization. So we're, we're just going to pretend now that, you know, this number is always going to be one. Okay. Um, and then I can define uh, a Jacobi field because from each point, remember, I have a geodesic. So uh, so these guys define a Jacobi field along, along the horizontal uh, geodesic here. Maybe I should have drawn a little smaller, right? But, you know, infinitesimally, if I take a derivative of gamma s in s, I define a Jacobi field. And then we can look at the value of this Jacobi field here uh, when we reach uh, time uh, equal to one. Uh, and look at, in particular, at its vertical component, right? So E2 here is the is tangent to the blue curve. Um, and then if I look at the derivative of the function f with respect to s, the thing that I want to be equal to zero, this here is exactly the value of this va at one. So va is the horizontal component of the Jacobi field, okay? Uh, sorry, va prime, it's the derivative of that. And um, the thing that I want to be different from zero is the derivative in A of VA prime of one, okay? So I want this to be zero and I want this to be not zero to apply uh, Kronda Rabinovitz. So how do we find values of A where this happens? A equal A star where that happens? Well, we need to use uh, some sturm neuville theory, okay? So if you write down the Jacobi equation uh, and you use the symmetries, it translates to this nice uh, family of sturm neuville equations, but they are singular, okay? So um, whatever this function looks like, it, it looks complicated, but the only relevant thing that you should remember is that at zero, P is zero, okay? So they are singular at zero because, uh, because P A of zero is equal to zero. And when you do sturm neuville theory, you want this function to be positive on the whole interval. And here it's not, okay? It's equal to zero there, and this causes some headaches, but you can get around it. Um, so this here's the Jacobi equation. And this initial condition is the free boundary condition so that the Jacobi fields are actually, you know, in the right space. Um, so let me show you how you, how you find the, the A stars where, you know, one of the derivatives is zero and the other is not. Well, you promote that equation to an eigenvalue problem, okay? So instead of putting zero here, let's put lambda, okay, times PA, times v and try to find eigenvalues for this problem. So this will be a subset of the spectrum of the Jacobi operator of the original uh, planar minimal two sphere. And if I find a solution to this problem, so here I am putting the boundary condition uh, v prime equal to one, which is what I want to find, the first derivative equal to zero, uh, v prime of one equal to zero, sorry, I believe I misspoke there. So this is, this is the derivative equal to zero of the function f. So if I have the solution to this, we call uh, lambda an eigenvalue. So uh, such lambda are called eigenvalues uh, of, of this problem, SLA. 
And if lambda is equal to zero, well, then I have a solution to the equation that, that I had here above, right? With the right condition, with this equal to zero. So eigenvalues equal to zero are uh, candidates, uh, the values of A that, that give me that are candidates to, to bifurcation, okay? So I want to find as many values of A as possible where zero is an eigenvalue for that problem. Okay, so the key lemma in, in all of this is the following. By studying the, uh, the strewn review problem, uh, we can show that there exists a sequence of, uh, of values a1, a2, a3, an, going to infinity, such that zero is an eigenvalue for this, uh, this problem, if and only if a is one of these uh, guys. And moreover, um, there is a, the zero that happens here, if I plot the lambdas you know, over there, uh, they exist from a little before and then they keep existing forever. So they start from slightly before the an and they survive for all of uh, infinity and they are always decreasing. Okay, so the eigenvalues look like this. Um, okay, so this you can do uh, using some, um, some singular analysis of, of this initial value problem. Okay, so you can do this with uh, Fuchs theorem, with Frobenius method, power series expansions and, and, and things like that. So the upshot is that we find, um, we find a sequence, a1, a2, a3, a4, a n, like that, where the derivative that we want it to be zero is zero. So this is VA prime of one. And this is because we solved the eigenvalue problem. And moreover, the mixed derivative that we want it to be not zero, this was DDA of VA prime of one. Uh, well, at a n, I guess here. So, so this happens to be equal to the derivative of the eigenvalue at a. So these, these functions that I drew here, lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, which are functions of n, okay? Uh, functions of a, I'm sorry. So they are decreasing functions of a. And therefore this quantity that I needed to be non-zero is non-zero. So I can apply the, um, the kronder rabinovitz theorem and I get these little bits of bifurcating branches here. But now we need to show that they persist, okay? Um, by the way, this, this was also observed by Hasselhoff and Ketover. Uh, they are able to show that the Morse index of the planar minimal to sphere goes to infinity. And this is somehow the bifurcation uh, way in which that manifests itself, okay? So these two things are, are closely related. So the difficulty now is to show that indeed uh, these branches don't just like, you know, connect like that and, and stay here, that they actually, you know, go on to infinity like in the other picture that I had. So in the last, you know, four or five minutes, let me, uh, let me do that by uh, showing you the last step, which was the global bifurcation result. So um, here we're gonna say a, a bifurcating branch is a connected component of the set of solutions when I remove the trivial branch, right? So I have the local bifurcation and then it goes on and maybe there's like a, a big component here and maybe has some, some other things going on. I mean, it, it could be topologically very complicated, right? So I just remove the, the trivial branch and I look at connected components. And then a theorem of Rabinovitz tells us that these components, either they are non-compact, so every bifurcating branch is either non-compact or it reattaches. It reattaches to the trivial branch. So either it, it exists forever, kind of like what I wanted to do, or it kind of connects back, okay? These are the only two things it can do. So I need to exclude this kind of behavior uh, to have non-compactness. And to do that, we define this counting invariant. So N A gamma is just, if I take any curve, okay? Any curve that intersects uh, the horizontal guy transversely, I can count how many times they intersect and I put that number there. So that's uh, just an intersection number. And one can show that this function is locally constant on the solutions, okay? And this is essentially because you have an ODE. If I had two of these, first of all, this is, this is an open condition, right? They're intersecting transversely. If I had a sequence of them that are getting closer and closer, in the limit, it would intersect tangentially. 
And then you have two solutions to the same ODE with the same initial condition. So they have to be the same, right? So that's a contradiction. So that's how we show this guy is locally constant along the bifurcating branches. And so the bifurcating branch remembers where it came from. The bifurcating branch knows whether it came from a one or a two or a three. It has that invariant equal to the index of the sequence uh, that, that gives rise to it. So if I look at BN, the nth bifurcating branch, so this guy here is BN, uh, and I count how many zeros its curves, all these points that lie in that branch, how many times does uh, this curve intersect the horizontal guy? That will be exactly equal to N, okay? And the way to show this is, um, is using uh, some, some results on, uh, about oscillation theory. So, uh, so here's how you show it. First of all, define this number of zeros of, of functions that, uh, of course, this is defined if the function is, is inter intersecting zero transversely here. Um, so this counts how many zeros the function has. By the Kramer Rabinovitz uh, theorem, the thing that locally gave me the existence of this branch, uh, one can actually show that if I'm close enough to the trivial branch, then the number of intersections is equal to the number of zeros of the Jacobi field that gave rise to that intersection, that gave rise to that bifurcation. So really what's happening is that if I zoom in here and I look at the tangent vector, the tangent vector to this bifurcating branch is somehow identified with the Jacobi field, with VAM. And so um, if they're very close, the Jacobi field is pushing things in one direction and then the other direction is pushing down and it has some zeros. These zeros are the places where the two curves will remain intersecting, okay? Um, and so uh, together with the fact that it's locally constant, I just need to show that this happens in the neighborhood of, of the bifurcation. And then oscillation theory tells me that um, the number of zeros of the nth Jacobi field is equal to how many eigenvalues have already passed zero plus one. So I just count how many negative eigenvalues I already have. So remember, A1 is the first time that something crosses, A2 is the next time, and so on, right? So these are the, the eigenvalues that we saw in the key lemma. Uh, so if I am, you know, here, I just count how many negative eigenvalues I have. In this case, I have one. Perhaps I had some other ones that started there before, but at least this guy. So I have at least these many zeros. And so the number of zeros of the nth Jacobi field is equal to n because I had n things already passing through zero. And as a result, then if this is n, this is n, and this guy is locally constant along the bifurcating branch, so all of them have n intersections, okay? So as a consequence, these guys cannot connect back because if they did, here I have, you know, five intersections, here I have six intersections, and that wouldn't uh, be possible because the function is locally constant, okay? So as a consequence, they're disjoint. And since they're disjoint, they don't reattach, so the, uh, the branches are non-compact. Okay, so that, uh, that somehow uh, concludes the proof. So this is my last slide. Uh, I show that uh, these bifurcating branches uh, are non-compact. It can also be shown that for each vertical line that I draw here, there's only finitely many intersections. So there's nowhere else for them to go, okay? They have to go off to infinity. So these guys intersect only finitely many times any of these kind of lines like that. So they can't, they can't come back. I could have some, you know, perhaps I have one here that decides to go back, but there's a most finitely many of them that do this. Infinitely many of them must persist all the way to infinity. So this happens for infinitely many uh, ends. And that gives me the um, arbitrarily many uh, non-planar minimal two spheres provided that I, that I go uh, far enough along here. Okay, so I believe I'm already one minute over time. I apologize and I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, are there questions? I have a question, Arjo. Yep. Um, so these uh, uh, these Jurassic's in the in this disk, um, I assume the length goes to infinity, and they have more and more self intersections, right? So, 
each along each branch, the number of intersections is constant, right? Each um, new branch has even more and more intersections. Are these are these curves close to one of the red and blue curves? So this is something that we expect to be true. So we expect that as A goes to infinity, they somehow concentrate here. Uh, we're not able to show all of this yet, but we're uh, you know, making progress to that. We, we think that they converge to the blue one with some multiplicity. So that's what the Ketov example looks like, right? Exactly. But they get only one. Right. So what does that look like in your picture, that one that they get? So they get only one also because they're working without symmetries, right? They have sure. A and B different. So if you- oh, do, they, do they assume they are distinct the axes or not? No, they don't have to. The theorem also applies to our case, but it's not completely clear whether the two width that they find, the minimal surface that they find uh, is one of these bifurcating branches or not. We don't know that. It could be that it's, it's this, it, it could be that it's this first one. It would make a lot of sense, yes. that, but yes. we don't. So this, this kind of problem on this disk reminds me of a paper by Alan Weinstein. So he looks at a situation where you can construct periodic orbits and have Hamiltonian systems on the, where the level surface is convex. He right. reduces that to a metric on the, on the disk uh, where the Jurassic with respect to the Finsler metric are the periodic orbits downstairs. He calls them break orbits. Uh, and his metric also goes to zero on the boundary. Then he has a trick to overcome that, which is something of the following type. I forget the details. So in your picture, look at say, look at the disk where the volume function is great equal to epsilon. So make it a little bit smaller. Now you right. manifold with smooth boundary. And yeah. if you look at US, if you are yeah. orthogonal to that manifold and you let the limit epsilon go to zero, you get US 6 orthogonal to the boundary. So that's how he overcomes this kind of problem. Um, and then you can do, for example, uh, uh, curve shortening methods to uh, sweep out and things like this, because you control what happens near the boundary with the G6. I don't know if those kind of tricks would help in this situation or not. I actually looked at his paper. Where, uh, it, it, it's one of the things that we, we tried at first. So uh, aside from the convexity issues with which we're not, I mean, I don't think this applies uh, with the same convexity thing. This idea of like just looking at an epsilon neighborhood and making the problem not singular uh, probably can also work here because as a consequence of what we show, there's a unique geodesic here, right? You can, if you already arrive here with the geodesic and orthogonally, you can continue it and in a unique way. So in some sense, yes, you can, you can use this to reduce it to a, a non-singular problem. Um, I see. But then, but I mean, yeah. Your, met, your met is also explicit, right? You can write down this met explicitly. Oh yeah, absolutely. How simple is it? Uh, define simple. I mean, <laughs> uh, you look at the ODE, uh, I, I wrote the ODE down with, with Mathematica to do some numeric simulations and see what it looks like. And it has uh, the, the nonlinear ODE for the geodesics. It fits in about a page, uh, the, two, the two systems. So it has, it's nonlinear, right? And it's, uh, it has nonlinearities of third order already in the first derivative. So it's like second derivative plus a polynomial of degree three on the first derivative and on, on the value. Uh, you know, Mathematica can solve it numerically, except that at, not at singular points, of course. It can, it can solve it numerically if I start here from, from the middle, right? But, uh, but from the singular boundary, it becomes numerically unstable. And uh, I don't really know, I tried a few things, but I, I don't think it's a wise way to, to study the problem by just brute force on the OD. It seems does, does mathematics give you an indication of where they look like and what, they, what they're supposed to be? It gives you some intuition. For example, if I, if I shoot from here inwards and I get too close to the boundary, but not, not coming in an orthogonal direction, then it gets uh, spun away. It, it somehow, the, you can see very clearly on Mathematica that the boundary is repellent. So if I'm shooting here, you know, it, 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 it turns. And the closer I get, the sharper the turn. So that's already- That's convexity. That's convexity. Just, well, like, just like in Weinstein's paper, that's convexity. That's this uniqueness here, right? And convexity, right? They come close, they go, they go away. That's convexity, the boundary. 
right, right, other, other boundary, yes, okay. A certain similarity to Swanstein's paper. I don't know if you looked at that or not. It's so interesting. We looked at paper, yeah, but um, yeah, maybe we should look at it again. I mean, it, it's been a while. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions? Um, yes, I have a question. This is Michael Eastwood speaking here. So, um, yeah, your pictures are for the case when uh, B and C are equal. So um, there's this special uh, blue and special red um, embedded spheres. Uh, what happens if uh, C is equal to D? And in fact, what happens if B and C and D are all equal? If all of them are equal, we get an even bigger group, right? We have an O3 act instead of just yes, an O3. Yes, yes. Um, it should make it simpler, yeah? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And then you can, I mean, the quotient would be one dimensional then, right? Yes. Uh, and then you have, but, but then you have a, a problem, which is minimality then is just being a critical point for volume. Volume is a function on a one dimensional thing. And yes. it's zero on the boundaries. So it has certainly one critical point in the middle by Rolle's theorem as you teach in calculus. And that's a minimal surface. But, but you need to show that then it oscillates up and down and up and down and up and down, right? So yeah. that is probably doable, uh, but um, in that situation, couldn't you just take a take a quotient by uh, SO two again? Then you get a metric on this disk, which is rotationally symmetric. Oh, yeah, that's another way of seeing it. Yeah, if it should I be much easier to solve the differential equation, for example. You oh yeah, explicitly in that case. Absolutely, because then you have a killing field, you can integrate away. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You have a first integral. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in some sense, the, the, you know, uh, we, we were really hoping to do it without any symmetries. I mean, I shouldn't say this in the, in the symmetry seminar, but uh, symmetries are really like, a, you know, a, a, a way to save something and, and still be able to do it with the ODE to have that uniqueness and use the bifurcation tools in the way that we do. But of course, one hopes to prove the exact same result, just sending A to infinity without assuming that any of them are equal to one another. Uh, that's most likely what happens. Uh, it's just that with the techniques that we use right now, we, we need the, at least two of them to be equal. So we're, where we're trying to go is actually in the opposite directions, to make fewer of them equal to one another. Yeah, so, so C equals D is okay, is it, for your analysis? Yeah. But you get a different picture. I mean, there's no this 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 uh, this very long uh, sphere. Uh, yeah, there's lots of those. Yeah. So so the horizontal guy, this this very long. Yeah one, yeah yeah. Be there because that's a. We're never touching a. Oh What's sorry, the other the other one, the other one. Sorry. Yeah yeah. The other one yeah. will be the other semi-axis. Instead of being the shortest one, will be the second shortest one. Yeah. So I mean, if, even though they are ordered, qualitatively is again just a permutation. Okay. Concerning that other suggestion, actually, why can't you do something like follows? So assume three are the same, right? So then this metric on the quotient is rotationally symmetric. You can solve the differential equation. Uh, you get the solutions and now make them go apart a little bit. So it's like a deformation of the metric where in the limit, you know, the, the, you know the, what the geostics are. Mm -hmm. And then you want to do some kind of continuity method that uh, they get transformed into Jurassic when you, when you move the, the two of them apart or the three that are equal. So you're saying to go from, from two being equal to none being equal? No, no, from three being equal to two yeah. being equal. Yeah, that's, I, I believe that's more possible than, than the, the other option of going from two being equal to none being equal. Sure, sure, uh, of course, of course. Kind of, you need some kind of non-degeneracy, right? To be able to do that. But you, would, you should be able to, cons to, con to, in, uh, to compute the, the index or the nullity of these explicit geostics on the rotation symmetric disk. That's what you need to do, right? And then, then you get nearby solutions again. Yeah, so, but, but what I'm afraid is you're going to get the genericists coming from the symmetries, right? So every, it's true that all the genericists are called, caused by the killing fields, but that allows you to perturb in the space of invariant things with that amount of symmetries. And the thing you wear, where you want to perturb doesn't have it anymore. So I'm not sure about that point. That, that's what, I mean, maybe there's a way around it, but at least 
an immediate application of, of some kind of equivariant version of the implicit function theorem would need the deformation to retain the same amount of symmetries and not lose any. I mean, in that case, not degeneracy, but perpendicular to the symmetry would allow you to do perturbations. Like you see, if you have critical sub manifolds that are not, not degenerate, they persist. Non-degenerate with respect, equivalently non-degenerate. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And, but then I think that they would persist on deformations that are still under the same kind of group of isometries. Well, you, you, you change the disk to something that's not rotation symmetric anymore, so it can't be, it can't be invariant under that group. Anyways, sorry. I mean, the way that I would think about it is applying the implicit function theorem on the space of invariant uh, ambience, and, and that's not there. So that, that's why uh, sure. I would yeah, there might be a way. Are there any other questions? If not, thank you again, Renato. It was thank very you. nice.